No, no, we're not. <laughs> okay. No. Can you tell me so it's live? I think so. Okay, cool. Fingers crossed it's live. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh. And I'm just, I'm always trying to figure out how to do the, like on YouTube, like it always shows like one screen, like just like the face, like really, I want to have it, you know how it's like right oh, now. Yes. Yeah. See, like, I feel so embarrassed because I'm like, I know that I'm young and a millennial, but I just, I just can't do technology. It's hard. It's a lot to figure out. There is, especially yeah. with all of this. Okay. Let me try to Everyone's just gonna be enjoying our, or should I go here so I can also like watch the comments? Oh, okay, we are live because someone just wrote first. And it looks <laughs> like we have two screens. <laughs> awesome, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you so much for joining us on this lovely Saturday, July 25th. Um, for anyone who's their first time joining us, welcome to your very first Because We've Read YouTube live conversation, book club conversation. Um, we are a radical international book club with chapters all around the world. And we are really focused on reading revolutionaries, um, the voices of people who have been silenced, um, erased from our textbooks, and also like not America centric authors. So we try very much to really uplift the voices of people who have been silenced on a global scale um, and the books that have been banned on a global scale um, and really understanding how interconnected all of our struggles are. Not that they're the same, but that understanding oppression in one country is very important because it's probably replicated in a different way where we're living um, or in the context of just blackness exists everywhere you know <laughs> so um, yeah we're really really excited for this unit um, we were gonna actually think about doing this unit as an emergency read given the uprisings in the United States but I think that would be unfair given that what is happening in the United States is I think unprecedented in terms of like the level of the uprising and the fact that everyone's now saying police abolition, which is like wild and exciting, but also not sort of at all abnormal because people, particularly like black organizers and activists have been calling for police abolition. Um, these issues are not new issues, they're old issues, but we're using new tools to sort of reimagine um, the world and also figure out how to strategize and, and resist. So that's really, exciting but at the same time I think that's why we wanted to make sure that this was not an emergency read but a standard because we've read read that happened to lay this month um, and specifically um, people like James Baldwin, um, Audre Lorde, all of the people who we linked in this unit um, are have sort of laid the, fr the framework and the foundation and the groundwork to be able to understand our current moment um, and I think it's just the, there's so much, I think, particularly in this book, um, fabulous book, that I think is, is really, really beautiful and important, um, but also I feel like is really complicated. It's a really easy read. Um, like you can just like, you can literally read it all in one sitting, but I think it's almost deceptive, deceptively complicated, I think, um, because it's so easy to read. So I think, especially for, um, any non-Black people tuning in, it's really important that we have a conversation to understand really like what is being said and not allow surface level, particularly white readings to really destroy, I think the significance of what is being said here. So um, that being said, I'm also really excited <laughs> for the beautiful Jamila Woods uh, to be joining us today. And um, yeah, we're so excited to just talk about your work and your thoughts and your feels and, and everything. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's my first Because We've Read event too. Hey, <laughs> welcome. Um, amazing. How are you on this July 25th? I'm, doing, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, yeah, I'm grateful to have a weekend. I started teaching and so now my weekends are real again. For a while it was like every day could be a weekend, but now I have more structure. So I'm grateful for today and to have slept good. Um, well, you look, your skin is glowing and fabulous. Really. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I love your earrings, where are they from? Thank you. Um, this, they're from, um, her name is Sal, or their name is Sal. Oh. Um, and um, Sal So Groovy on Instagram. The best. And they make them out of yarn. <laughs> and they also styled your entire music video 
for yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. that's true yeah they styled that video and did a great job <laughs> yeah their work is so also like visionary in like a very specific way and i love that um just we love you <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think uh, I really just want to start by talking about that music video, Baldwin and Your Music, um, just because it's such a powerful song that is also incredibly complex. And I feel like is such a beautiful way that like pulls out and like weaves from the book into like your own experiences and your own like things that you're grappling with and then kind of like goes back into the book. So I feel like it's such a a beautiful and like accessible way to even engage with Baldwin, even if you don't even read the book, at least just listen to Jamila's song, Baldwin, yeah. and watch you the video. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, but you wrote the song also two years ago. So I'm wondering, um, like, what is your, what was your thought process sort of writing the song? Where were you at, I guess, two years ago in, in terms of your engagement with this book or Baldwin's work in general? And also what has changed, if anything, in the two years since you've written it? Yeah, um, well, I know when I was writing, it was in the context of a project where I was naming every song after like a writer, artist or thinker who had influenced me or my art in some way. And I was really thinking about the letter to my nephew, um, letter to his nephew that is in the beginning of the book and really thinking about the passage where um, he's kind of, charging his nephew um, to love white people and kind of um, thinking about how difficult that is or how I, when I first read it, I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> let's slow down. <laughs> um, you have I, to interact with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so, and then, and then the time in my life I was working, you know, I had a lot of, like we all do as people of color, lots of microaggressions in my daily life. It was like everything going on politically that's always going on. Um, and I was trying to write a song that encapsulated my feelings about that sentiment, but also um, a lot of the, the other things that Baldwin talks about is about the fear um, and like the possessive investment in like their, their whiteness, but also in their fear that leads to um, white people or systematic um, sanctioned violence against black people. And so I was trying to kind of grapple with both of those things. And the song with, for me, I usually don't direct my songs more broadly. I usually kind of am thinking about myself or my community, my sisters, black people when I'm writing kind of subconsciously, if not overtly. And this song, it was like, I was trying to really right to both. Like there's kind of something going on in the, in the hook that's more talking to black people um, or more inward facing. And then the verses are more like, you clutch your purse and you cross the street when you see a black person walking, like you show up in the neighborhood and instantly it's gentrified. Like it's kind of more speaking outward, which was new, different for me. So the whole process of making the song felt a little uncomfortable. Cause I was like, it could get, it could get into this place of like, just not feeling nuanced, not feeling super complex. And my producer was like, okay, well, I think we need to watch some battle rap because in battle rap, um, it's all about Great. knowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like we sat there on YouTube and did it together for hours. And he was explaining how in battle rap, your opponent, you have to know them so well, um, almost to the point of loving them like because you have to be able to say things about them that are so true and are going to hit in a way that's going to get <laughs> your <all> insecurities <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so that was sly a. shout out to sly a. but um that helped me approach the song in a more um in a more nuanced way i think that i hope um comes across yeah yeah and that's also something else that was like really i guess like different or like striking for me was that it it seemed like you did have that broader audience for this song. Um, was that harder to write? It definitely was because it's also like that position of like this being my perspective. And you know, whenever as a black person, if you speak from your perspective about white people, especially it becomes like easy to essentialize that and say like, this is, oh, this is speaking for black people, which is not the case, but it was, kind of just the delicate wanting to make sure I said, I spoke to my actual feelings um, at the root of them um, and not just 
like bye I hate you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> We should have also been fair and valid. And That's true. Like, it's true. Song. <laughs> it's true. And there's other, I think that comes across maybe in different ways in different songs, but with this one, I was trying to challenge myself. Cause I think that's part of the, the ask of from Baldwin too, is like challenging to go deeper and like love doesn't necessarily mean like, I like you or like, I'm nice to you or trying to make you happy, but that it's like, I'm going to ask myself the deeper questions about, why you, you are the way you are mm. yeah and I definitely want to get into this idea of love um in a second too but I guess what um it maybe from this book or like maybe another of his writings is there like a passage or a line or like an idea that was really like moving for you or like made you think or that you grew from the most um it really is that passage about love in terms of thinking about this song um there's there's other rereading it <clears throat> for this conversation there's like different parts that I resonated with I don't know but I have like I have like the printed quote about love that I realize is like on my altar because I just like from and this is like a screenshot of like my tumblr from like you oh my God, so it's like very like resonant with me through um yeah we don't have to we don't have to drop the tumbler. But um, yeah, it's that quote, like love takes off the mask that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or as a state of grace, not in the infantile, infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. And I think I was looking at that in so many different moments for so many different in so many different contexts, but just the idea of love as an active choice and an active process that um, is also about seeing yourself and being seen. And so that, um, thinking about that, I think I revolve around that, like continue to come back to it a lot. Yeah, and I feel like that also, like I can, I can, I feel like I can see that so much in so much of your work, like this, like, this idea of love and like the different ways that it manifests for yourself and for your community or for like people who, you know, like, I think it's really, it's very visible. And I think, and I think that's something that also makes your work so particularly beautiful is like what you're like, I guess, wrestling with or like working through. Um, and that passage also I had underlined and I think made me stop and like sit with a little bit um, to think about love as like for like ourselves and not for the other person necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think that was really powerful um but I think so but now going back to the music video oh also someone says that quote is on page 102 to 103 if people want to look at y'all are fast I was like trying to find it I was like nope <laughs> wow. um I yeah my book, okay. <laughs> what? my book is like I think the pages are different so I'll try to remember that when I'm saying things oh yeah no, like yes <laughs> I also just have so much underline I'm just like I can't even <laughs> um but to go back to your music video also really quickly um do you mind talking a little bit like about like the the visual aspects of it like there's obviously like very clear themes that I think everyone can like understand very quickly like the Harry Potter references um which were very fun and exciting um but so do you mind going through and maybe talking about some specific elements of the visuals of this music video and why they're in there what they mean yeah um the original concept that I had was thinking about all of the closed schools in Chicago um and so I'm really bad with years but I think it was like around 2015 or 2016 when um 50 public schools in Chicago were closed by the mayor and there was a lot of movements and um, organizing around that. But um, I wanted to shoot, like imagining, you know, the, the way in, in books like Harry Potter or like the anti-mirage idea, like there's like something on the outside, like it looks like a closed school on the outside, but really everybody in the community knows, like all of the black people know that inside it's like this radical school that is not allowed to exist in this current mm -hmm. society, but has to kind of be hidden. And so that was the initial idea. And then I 
worked with a Chicago production company, VAM, and Vincent Martel was the director to kind of bring it to life. And like, we kind of ran with that kind of platform nine and three quarters from Harry Potter reference of like, having it be like a black Hogwarts inside, but like the magic being, the magic being more like just that idea of black radical thought as like, the central central factor of the education and so it's like they starts out with these three um young black kids who are my students and like a friend's son um like running with their like shopping carts full of their school stuff and they run through the wall through the outside wall of the school and inside it's like they're um there's another one of my students or youth poets like she's performing a poem meant to be like there's young people also teaching each other it's not just a space where um there's like a you know adults holding all the knowledge and um there's like Baldwin quotes written on the blackboard there's like um it is a, a lot of like Harry Potter imagery which is unfortunate now <laughs> knowing more about her oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah whatever um geez. this is a better remake <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, so just kind of trying to get at that idea, but also it was Vincent's idea to have some sort of a last supper um, at the end that kind of also is like a reference to like the great hall in a lot of the Harry Potter um, films, but having all of like the, the faculty or kind of like the black um, leadership or like, you know, people looking at the younger generation and like applauding them, like saying like, like we believe in you and kind of like thinking about the letter to his nephew in that way like it's kind of like giving it over to him like you know it's like your generation to 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 take it take it from here sort of thing um so yeah that's kind of the thinking behind it yeah no that's really that's really beautiful and like I think that idea of like this imagination is also something that I want to come back to and I think is so like beautifully presented in that music video um one highly important question is how did you get the bird trained? There's like a bird. <laughs> was it trained all day? You have snacks. <laughs> it was actually the space that we found in Pilsen in Chicago. Um, they just had an owl. Really? Like, yeah, they just had an owl. You didn't even plan that? No. And then, like, it was meant to be. The magic was meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we had a lot of shots of it just flying. Yeah, I heard that you really love birds. <laughs> yeah, I'm idea. sorry about your chicken. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Chicken. Also, the, the photo that I posted on Instagram for anybody who did see that, that also announced this reading, apparently they just lost that chicken. So, yeah. Silence for Shout out to Annie, wherever you are. Come home. What was her name? Annie. Oh. Annie. <laughs> Annie, if you're watching this, I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, awesome. No, and I also think that, I mean, I don't know if it was intentional, but I feel like the, there is so much also in Baldwin's book, like the centrality of faith, um, like both his experiences with the church and then also with the nation of Islam, um, that I felt like that also fit and like pulled a little bit out from the music video and sort of interacted with that. Um, at least that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. I think that was definitely in Vincent's in intention too with this definitely Last Supper reference and all the um, infusing blackness into it however we could. We're all eating Popeyes, I don't know, or fried chicken and like we're just all like wearing like koofies and like yeah just kind of like imprinting onto that image. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah and I know that um, like you also have like on a personal level like different relationships also with like both like the Muslim community in Chicago and beyond, as well as like the church. So I'm wondering if like anything that Baldwin sort of spoke to, is that, do you feel like, do you resonate with any of that? Like, did you have different, like how do you sort of grapple with his also take on faith in this book? I really resonated uh, with like him describing that summer of being 14 and kind of like starting to think of being in the church and just a religion in a different way. Cause I, I grew up, going to church um, since I was very young, um, mostly mostly a particular church that was my grandma's church, but <clears throat> also my parent, my dad went to a different church. So I saw like different iterations of how 
um, like kind of black Christian churches. Um, and so I remember distinctly like sitting in Sunday school and also or like going to the sermon and my mom picking me up and us kind of like dissecting like all the reasons, all the things that didn't sit right with me. And I think I really, I really, the idea that Baldwin said about it feeling like some kind of blackmail, like the idea that in order to like you love God, not not really because you you might not really love God, but because you're afraid of what might happen if you don't. And I kind of, I resonate with that. But then on the other hand, like there's at one point where he says, but I can't just leave it at that because in the black church is like where I've seen the most kind of beautiful, like the, he talks about the music and just like the freedom that people seem to achieve. And mm -hmm. um, also like, there's a part, I think for me, it's on page 43, but um, he talks about like sensuality. Um, I guess we do have the same. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, and like to be sensual, I think, is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does from the effort of loving to the breaking of bread. And kind of like having witnessed that, I, I definitely resonate with having witnessed that in the church and... <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry <laughs> it's not the Rona <laughs> um but yeah and so it's like those two things like they coexist and there's like so many problems that I saw and like so many things that bothered me um and felt constricting about growing up in the church but also there's like I think he says truly feel love there but I definitely felt like and witnessed love and felt it from people who didn't know me and just loved me because I was my grandma's granddaughter. Um, so it's like those two things that kind of are always tensions for me. Um, but I think the music is definitely the hugest influence that the church had on me is just gospel music and how that's influenced the way that I write and the way that I think about music and art in general. Mm. Yeah, and I think that sort of like conflict or that tension um, is something that I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with inside and outside of the church, you know, um, mm -hmm. of all sort of like relationships to faith and the ways that it sort of like positioning faith and the ways in which we like grow up in the church or the masjid or wherever. Um, and then like the greater society in which we find ourselves and like how right and wrong sort of is translated and like replicated in different ways. Um, yeah, I think that was, I, I, but something that I feel like I struggled with a little bit was like his, I, I feel like a little bit unfair toward the nation of Islam. Um, and I think that's also why we wanted to include the secondary reading of um, Muslims in the carceral state. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you haven't read it, also read this. this is, chapter two is great, but about how um, sort of like the ways in which um, Muslims, particularly black Muslims have sort of used um, Islam in a way to resist the carceral state and how the, car the modern carceral state is now as it exists today because of that specific like resistance and the dialectic there. So mm -hmm. I think that's an important piece to read, although I can like I, yeah. And I think that that's sort of like another tension that I think um, I at least had that I want to talk to you about also is sort of like this relationship between violence and love um, in this book. And I, and I feel like um, it almost, and maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but it almost felt like, especially the first time that I read this, that it seemed like violence and love were mutually exclusive. Um, and that violence wasn't actually being specifically defined. You know, today, I think when we use the word violence, like it means just like someone shooting another person, for example, and we not state violence, not like, you know, domestic violence, like all these sorts of violences that exist, um, both like an individual level as, as it is given down to us from the state or also state-based violence is always erased from these conversations of violence. Um, so I wish that violence was defined a little bit more, um, like less ambiguous terms. Um, I mean, I do say like on page 83, he does says, um, he says, whoever debases others is debasing himself. Mm -hmm. um, that is not a mystical statement, but a realistic one, which is proved by the eyes of any Alabama sheriff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like, I, and I, I agree with sort of, and also what you mentioned a little bit earlier about like love and the role of love is to, for yourself and not like for the other and the ways in which the sorts of violence and hatred can also be more self-consuming. Um, but also I think, um, and like 
for example, the, the line by Kimberly Jones recently, and she says that they're lucky black people are looking for equality and not revenge. <laughs> you know, and I think that that's very clear. Like there's not like, we're not trying to replace oppressors, we're trying to end oppression. And I think violence necessarily becomes somewhat a part of that equation. Like recently, we know when we see cop cars on fire, um, people are labeling that as violent, um, even though I would disagree that that's violence, you know? So maybe it's just that, yeah. You know, violence is being defined in a very particular way. But I'm I'm thinking though, like, and specifically in this historical unprecedented moment, um, where we're talking about chaos, uprising, violence, all these terms, um, what is the relationship between love and violence for you? And do you feel like for Baldwin? Um, and do you feel like they're mutually exclusive? Or I guess like, yeah. And what is the role of love in, and how does it manifest in liberation spaces? That was like a lot. <laughs> I think you're really right that violence, like the definition of how he's using it is kind of left a little bit ambiguous or open. Um, but with, I guess, to throw in like another thing in there, like I feel like when he's talking about violence often, like he's also talking about fear or like the power to wield fear. Mm -hmm. um, and so like in the, in the first, I think it's like early in the, like maybe like page 21, where he's saying like um, Negroes, oh, even the most successful Negroes proved that one needed in order to be free, something more than a bank account, one needed a handle, a lever, a means of inspiring fear. And like thinking about throughout the book it's like there's fear on one side uh like that's being like the church instilling fear you know if you're not morally good as a black person like there's no like you don't have a value and then on the other side like talking about white people needing to instill fear um or and having fear um of black people like justifying their actions against them and so i think it's like somehow i don't know in my mind it's like he's he's using violence in a way that's linking it to like the power to make someone fearful as opposed to like violence to liberate from the system that the the, the currency of fear is operating in or something yeah so i don't know i think for me i de i definitely i don't know i don't know where i'm still i'm still kind of thinking about because I think for me, part of why why I'm so fascinated in Baldwin is because I don't read like anger doesn't resonate with my spirit. Like I've never been like it's it's something that I feel like I feel it taxing me. I feel it like when I feel angry, I feel like sick. And so I know other people like in my life are like it helps. Like it's good. Like it helps. Like I get I get that rush and it comes through me in a certain way and. I think I'm always trying to think about like what what's the utility of something. So if I can see like, and I definitely see the utility of like having black people having arms, like, you know, like in order to like have a goal to towards liberation. Um, so I don't know, I feel like I'm like rambling, but I- I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling uh, because I think I want, I want black people to feel empowered to, to the tools that are necessary. Um, even if like, that's going to look different for every person. Um, so I don't know. I think I'm, I'm given permission by a lot of Baldwin's work to imagine what, what that looks like for me. But I think, I don't know. I think he might have a limitation that I might not agree with around um, what might be necessary ultimately. Cause I think he has a lot of optimism in this work that I don't know if he carried throughout the rest of his life. Cause I, I read like the studs Turkle, like the last interview with James Baldwin. And he has like, by the end of his <laughs> life saying like, artists have to disturb the peace, otherwise chaos. Like he's like kind of on another plane. But I think in this moment, he has a sense of like, optimism or, or, or hope that I think um, sometimes I feel that way and sometimes I don't. So it's like hard for me to 
kind of speak to it in a broad way, I guess. Uh, I mean, this might be a really challenging question, but do you feel, how about in this moment? Like, do you feel the optimism and the hope? Mm. I feel this moment has provided um, definitely an opening similar to how other moments have, but this is the one that I'm, I always am careful about like the kind of now more than ever because I feel like it's, it kind of erases like prior moments, but I do think that this is the first time that I've experienced um, more people, like you said, talking about abolition and like using this language that's been around for a long time and thinking of it as possible, as opposed to just wild and like kind of unimaginable. Um, and, and also for me, like I've learned more about what that means. Like I've been like, yeah, yeah, prison abolition, but like to actually understand what that means, like defunding the police and giving resources to these other places that need it. Um, so I, I do feel optimistic in this moment, um, but I also like going to protests and you know seeing the police knocked out the teeth of a young black girl. And it's like, what do you do? Like, I, mm. if I could, like if in my body I could beat a cop's ass, like I would, like <laughs> if I was, you know, that's what, what I would want to do, but <laughs> so I don't know it's like I'm not I feel so humbled by this moment I think more than anything because I think it's a moment when I'm trying to reconcile my ideas with like my physical body and like how I move in the world um so I'm and also adding pandemic to it it's like it's a wild time. <laughs> yeah, it's a wild time. And I think that something that runs throughout this book for me is also his internal soul, he's talking about his internal soul, like people's internal souls with like the external. And so I think for a lot of people, like whether we wanted to or not, like the pandemic forced a sort of like interrogation with just being with yourself, sitting with yourself for maybe longer than you normally would and how that can, that has to be a part of any movements like in the, in society, in the external world. Um, so that provides an opportunity um, and also a lot of like terrible negative things too, but it's illuminating those things about like how the system is, has been always destined to hurt marginalized people so yeah. yeah that was a lot I feel like I just want to sit with I hear the birds in the background of your house too I'm like oh, I'm so nice. oh yeah maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the lost chicken no <laughs> Children, <laughs> <singing for her. laughs> um someone also MTL Bradford says speaking of the utility of anger Audre Lorde's essay the uses of anger women responding to racism is a good read mm, I have to read that I think I read that. Um, so I just have a few more questions, but also anybody who has questions could obviously feel free to leave them or thoughts, um, comments as you're also like listening to like join. Um, but, and something that, so this that you just sort of ended on with, um, and you mentioned that I think was really powerful was that like Baldwin gave you like the, what was the word that you used? Permission. Yeah, permission. Perfect, yeah, to like imagine the world of love and like how like love can like be central in this and I feel like imagination is also so central um to both our movements and uh, came up a lot in this book as well and I think one thing um that he mentions on page 80 also is like how can one however dream of power in any other terms and the symbols of power and I thought that was something that was really striking and I had to like sit with a little bit too um just because like I, I think that there's there's so much, and I think this comes back to the conversation we just had about like, how are we moving forward um, if we can't imagine anything outside of, you know, the tools of oppression in order to move us forward. So I'm I'm thinking about like, like also also yesterday last night you were at the Freedom Square protest mm -hmm. um, or rally event of the, marking the four years where um, Black abolitionists took over. A square right outside of a, a police torture on a black site where like thousands of people, particularly black people were disappeared and tortured by Chicago police department. 
Um, so Black abolitionists four years ago took over that space for over a hundred days and literally just created the world that they wanted to see. And there was just so much music and art um, and like young people running around. It was such a beautiful space. Um, and so really imaginative. I feel like it really gave permission to a lot of people to be able to sit and imagine like what that world could actually look like and like put that imagination into practice, which I think is so important. And I don't think we're doing enough in our movements. Um, and also you mentioned in like your, in your music video, there was sort of like the, the dreams and imaginations for what that school could look like or like what education in Chicago at the very least um, for black youth could look like. Um, and I think those testimonials that the, the young people said, your students at the very end were just so profound and so like beautiful, um, but also like heartbreaking that, you know, this one has to imagine like a fair education, you know, mm -hmm. but I think, I guess I'm thinking about like what sort of, what role does imagination play in your work and your art? Um, and how do you see it manifesting in our movements? Mm. I think one one thing when you were speaking that I thought about was just um, being at the protest and like some of the chants or just some of the like the literature being handed out to people in the neighborhood being about like, you know, we don't need police. Like I forget the chance, like like something like uh -huh. you, you don't need your job or something like that. And it's just like I the the idea like in the book where Baldwin's saying like we don't want like black people don't want to be white people or to have what they have like it's not about that like we have everything that we need and i think that's something like a, a shifting and like in the in this time um that i've been trying to really internalize like not and it, it reminds me of like past times in my life like i grew up in a very white neighborhood in chicago and went to very white schools and found my like when I got out of that when I went to college it was like an unlearning of all of these things that I thought I, I had to be like and so I think like that reframing um helps me to think of imagining for myself something that's not in relation to whiteness um or not reliant on that power structure and so I think that I, I guess in my music um in my music, I think I'm often thinking about it in a sort of like mantra way or in a sort of way like you speak, like affirm affirmations, you know, you speak in the present tense what you want. And I feel that way when I'm writing songs or like when I look back at songs kind of, cause when I'm writing, I don't know what I'm thinking about. When I look back, I'm like, oh, when I say this, it's gonna like put in my body the energy that I need to, to live this way. And I remember like, um, after I finished the last album that I did, I was like very heartbroken. And like, I was in like a very like personal moment of like feeling really emotionally down. And I was like, oh, I didn't even write any songs about heartbreak. Like I didn't even write like the album that I needed right now. And then like after touring and speaking, like singing songs named after Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and like Eartha Kitt, I, it was like, so empowering and Baldwin, you know, to like be like chant, feeling like I'm channeling their spirits every day. I was like, oh, I didn't need to be writing about this, <laughs> whatever. I got that, I got what I needed from thinking about like my ancestors and my heroes and, you know, so I don't know if that really answers the question, but I think I try to think of like not imagining something so aspirational, but like imagine it, imagining it as, a given and I hear that um, Alexis Pauline Gums has this like course right now that she's doing about the Kombahi River uprising and one of the things she was saying is like Harriet Tubman said like she woke up from a dream and she said my people are free she didn't say my people will be free she didn't say they should be she was like they are and like we all should just live into that knowledge of our freedom and so that's that I feel like that's how I try to write songs is how is is feeling it possible now in the present. I love that. And I feel like there's so much of that being done also with like abolition right now in ways that like I would have never imagined. You know, I feel like there was there is not I mean there was a lot of people talking about abolition before like these uprisings started, but I like I know that 
just a week before I had posted something about prison abolition, which feels like the easier form of abolition. And mm -hmm. people were like up in arms. And then a week later, everyone's the police abolitionist, <laughs> which is exciting, but also I think a little bit concerning because I think now a lot of people are using this language without actually being able you know to like, articulate it. Yeah, yeah. Or like saying like, oh yeah, you know, like, like reforms that they're calling abolition, you know, so I'm, it's sort of also being a little bit diluted, but I think that there's so much imagination that's happening also at this moment that hasn't um, been articulated so broadly, I think. Um, I just shared a graphic or saw one just the other day um, that had like police tools that were like repurposed, like after, it's like after, you know, after police are ab like abolished, this is like what the world would look like. And it was like, the, you know, the CPD or like the sh police van and it was turned into an ice cream truck they're just like very cute things that I was like, this is so like, this is so tangible. Like it feels like right there. And I think that idea of like, just speaking the reality that we want as the present is so, so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen things like that too, like different scenarios that, cause often people's answer is like, if there's no police, like how will we handle this situation or like a break-in or something. And like someone made a graphic, like explaining like, a trained professional in, in conflict de-escalation comes to your house and like just stuff like that really like feels good to, to read like not just mentally but like it feels like very healing to like know that yeah and it, it just makes like the world that we want feel so tangible mm -hmm. um, and somebody um Rebecca Hubbard also said yes to affirmations for a new reality imagining a different reality feels our hope and we need to hope to continue the work from a place of love, not fear or desperation, which I think is really, um, yeah. And then I guess one last question that I'll ask before I ask some of these questions that have been posted. Um, you mentioned uh, in your song, <laughs> you're reading the books you ain't read. <laughs> and Baldwin obviously is centering like knowing yourself and your history and I'd be drowning in it, but using that. Um, so what have you read <laughs> and what do you recommend for people to read to sort of explore these topics that we talked about and more? Mm. Um, I think one thing that particularly black people and like people in movement work, like that's been really useful for me lately is Pleasure Activism by Adrienne Marie Brown um, because she starts out the book with uses of the erotic um, by Audre Lorde and then kind of extrapolates from there this whole idea of like feeling good being a pathway to liberation like part of the path to liberation is not to work ourselves to the bone without thinking about you know our our spirit and our body um, as just like a tool to like get us to a place but like as refueling it um and so that's been a really good book to me um when I wrote those lyrics I was really thinking about like white people reading <laughs> but um yes I also <laughs> <love> you read. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> um awesome um one thing oh yeah one question that we have uh by Remis Banuri says what are your thoughts on page 47 um, when Baldwin talks about being willing to let go of God, if its concept does not make us more loving, and if it's relevant to movements, and if it's, and if it's relevant, and I guess if it's irrelevant to movements in America today. Yeah, I enjoy that part. Um, the part. Oh, yeah. The concept of God has any validity or any use it can only be to make us larger freer and more loving if god cannot do this then it is time we got rid of him and i think that's nice that it says like him there too because i like i remember that's how i remember feeling like in church it just felt like oh you're saying love everybody but then you're talking about queer people or you're talking about muslim people like as you like you're not talking about them lovingly so it just was like a huge disconnect for me and I I agree like I have no I have to release that that God um and my imag my vision of God is different and isn't gendered and isn't um so patriarchal and um kind of like all like the system that we live in and that replicating that um and 
um, kind of justifying that system. And I love Octavia Butler and I've been reading like the parable of the solar and just thinking about, I mean, that's like she, she visioning God as just changed God as the force of change. God as not a loving, not God doesn't necessarily love you, but you know, it's like, God made you and it's more like it's less about that the love and more just like it's the force of change and you have to shape God you have to vision what God is and that's interesting to me um I'm yeah but I know like from when I was young like I had to release that that vision of God because it was not it it just was not what's the word aligning or sometimes yeah it just wasn't real to me it, it, it just felt um constricting and that's what all my conversations with my mom on the way home from church were like <laughs> and to like reimagine and say no like that's not what I think like what do I think what do I feel because I do feel something when we're singing these songs I feel a presence but I don't think they're talking about that presence like the right way or the way that I I see it feel it yeah, and I think this this question also is like really like really interesting. I think also I, when I remember when I read that line and it like pauses because it has like a paragraph like after I just like I like the huge exhale. I was like, oh, I remember I literally made an audible noise when I read that line because um, it's it's very profound. But I think it's also I think for me as someone who did not grow up in Muslim spaces <laughs> and I think sees so much of. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of young people who I know in diaspora or like recent refugees or immigrants talking about like, you know, seeing what's happening by just like dictatorships or countries in the Middle East that are claiming, you know, Islam or like religion in their name and then being like, and then we're gonna do all of these like oppressive, horrible things. Um, and I think people then like turning away from that, they're like, okay, if that's religion, then I don't want it. And so for me, I felt almost like a conflict with this line a little bit because I, I think it goes back to something that I was um, that we talked about too about how much of our reality is shaped by the world that we live in in the United States um, and wherever we are like the like the the language that we're given to us you know like putting someone in a cage is called like justice you know mm -hmm. and like the the ways that we're like framing what safety looks like as like police you know and I think that it's um, there's a lot of like unlearning that we're also doing and I think my what I have been grappling a lot with is like where is the line between like feeling uncomfortable with something because it goes against like this like state language for me um, as I'm like reading a religious text and then where does that actually like conflict with something that at my core I feel like is untrue and I feel like that's sometimes like a, a conflict that um like I think is is really is challenging sometimes to be able to like read and understand if my like where are my values coming from, mm -hmm. um, to be able to like put in conflict with like a text or like a religious text or something like that. So that was also like a rant, but <laughs> no, yeah, I really feel that. Um, someone also asks, Lori Thomas Scott, how do you both interpret the final quote? quote, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time, in relation to the text and also how it relates to this moment. Mm. Hmm. I feel like it starts from, if we do not now dare everything. The fulfillment of that prophecy. I was reading that prophecy as just that idea of like the power, like white people, there's like a line earlier where he's talking about like white people must um, see themselves and love themselves and then the Negro problem would cease to exist. So is that the prophecy? I mean, I, that's how I was reading it is like, if, if that doesn't happen and if we don't, if black people don't coexist, like learn to coexist with white people, then the, that would be the sign. That would be the, um, the fire next time coming. I don't know if I'm reading that right. I honestly like 
struggle with the ending kind of and struggle with because I think I don't um yeah I don't know um if he's saying like that would be like a moment when when God's looking at the earth again and being like y'all hot mess like we need to start over <laughs> like the, that's how I read the Noah's Ark story so I don't know I, don't know. <laughs> I love that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd also be interested to hear everybody else's thoughts on this line too. Um, I, not that I think that it's like cryptic at all, but I feel like there's a lot, there's a lot in that line that I also feel like I had to like sit with a little bit. And I, I also feel like complicated thoughts around. Um, I think in the way that I like understand it, and I don't think this is what Baldwin meant <laughs> by this, but I think the way that I'm reading this now and interpreting this for like today is um you know like I think people try to like be polite like in the ways that like demanding justice um demanding just like very basic things um and like try to do things quote unquote the civil way but it's not working <laughs> and yeah so, like, I kind of see like the fire next time is like well like it's it, it's almost like by not accepting like the the easy kind civil whatever discourse then they're necessarily asking for the fire um because that's the only like the only response that's going to come after you run out of water i think that speak or that makes me think about your question of violence again to then like mm -hmm. because i guess he stops the book there so we don't get to find out like what he thinks about that fire like the you know like like it that feels sounds like violence to me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But then also, yeah, I mean, like, given, hmm. Yeah, this is a good question. As someone, <laughs> people's answering this, Sonia K says, quote, in all caps, burn it all down. <laughs> I'm kidding, but like, not question mark. Kyle Larson says, burn it down. Well, we never are. <laughs> grateful for this very radical audience <laughs> um I mean I don't know if Baldwin actually wants things to get burned down I think it almost feels like maybe almost like a plea being like accept the water while you have the chance to because mm -hmm. um, the fire is coming um and you have that option and if you don't like there's nothing that you can do at that point or that even he can do at that point you know mm -hmm. all right what are yeah. we breaking down first <laughs> <laughs> um someone asks sorry i've like missed a lot of comments okay we probably have time for one or two more questions um what are oh we already asked that one can you talk about your can you talk about your nlt factor talk about your thoughts on telling our own stories and trusting our own experiences you start Baldwin with the powerful lyrics, you don't know a thing about our story, tell it wrong all the time. And on page eight, Baldwin says, quote, they do not know Harlem and I do. Take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your experience. Know whence you can, came. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the first part? Can you talk on your... Um, about your thoughts on telling your own stories and trusting your own experiences. Hmm. I think that's something that um comes or that I was taught through poetry and coming to poetry as a young person and um poets like Gwendolyn Brooks who are kind of really revered especially in Chicago for telling what she saw she was like I wrote about what I saw and heard on the on the street that was my material and so I think I've always just been empowered by that idea that no one can talk about my story better than I can and so as a person, like when I was young, I didn't feel I was a good singer, didn't feel I was necessarily like that special. And so that idea was like very powerful to me. Um, and I, I liked that line. And I think a lot of what, what in the letter to his nephew is coming through is like the, the tone and almost like the, the framing of the things that he says in that part feels different than like thing the ideas come back later in the book but he's saying them in a certain way um because it's to this younger person who he loves and i think 
a lot of it too is trying to teach empathy because I think like if you have a sense of empathy you can kind of like you can direct that inward towards yourself and you can be more self-compassionate and you can also um, have that vision like have that compassion for other people um, but I think for me that telling my story is like a part of knowing myself is like an act of knowing um, and um, is important for political reasons of like, if you don't tell your story, someone else will is often said. Um, but also I think it's just about me reflecting myself back to myself and seeing myself, um, which is very powerful, I think, because we're always fighting the, the representations that society has that are negative, that teach us to despise ourselves, like he says. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Two other people added their thoughts on that last line. <laughs> Angelica Ludke, I'm so sorry, says this is making me think of how I recently finished Avatar, oh. <laughs> The Last Airbender, and they talk about how fire is life, not anger and hatred. Hmm. Avatar. Cool. Wow. Did you Avatar. watch it? I just started it. <laughs> my sibling and my best friend love it, and they're really mad that I haven't finished it, but. I keep hearing Avatar like in reference to like, like people are making inspiration <laughs> readings into it. And I love that. So I need to watch it. Bullied into watching it by Ali Bullied. So I, I watched, I had to binge it. It was actually pretty good. And I think that was a really, well, I think that person kind of spoiled the ending for you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, my fault. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Hear that. Um, and then somebody else says, Oh yeah, Remy's Banuri says, I almost feel like it is foreshadowed slash explains his shift from being optimistic in his career, earlier writings to his transformation by his last interview. Yeah, I could see that. I like that. Yeah, he's like foreshadowing his own like hardening. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's like heartbreaking in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reading the last interview is very heartbreaking. Um, and okay, there is one last question. Okay, um, zero or Olimer, zero Limer. Not sure how <clears throat> this. Okay, uh, they say I read somewhere that Baldwin was so widely recognized because he made the experience of racism comprehensible to white people. Do you feel like Baldwin is writing for a black or white audience? Hmm. Mm, that's interesting. I do feel that sort of, like in the part where he's talking about going to Elijah Muhammad's house and he's like, and afterwards I was gonna go to my white friend's house and have drinks. Like, I do feel a, the sort of battle rap way that like, because Baldwin actually had white people who he loved and who he was friends with, he could speak to them and his language, like kind of the way he's so eloquent with words, like he could speak to them in a way that would make them listen. Um, and it reminds me of like that, what he says about America, like, because I love America, I reserve the right to critique her like so fully. And I think that um, that was definitely, his goal was to speak to people who, white people who, you know, weren't, awakened to that who weren't who weren't listening to that but I don't think he was only talking to white people at all um but I just think he had a special power to like elegantly read them in a way that um really cut through because he was close to them too um so I don't know I don't know but I definitely don't think that he was only his own his his main audience was white people that he was only trying to reach white people yeah, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think yeah. also just by virtue of like publishing something, you know that it's going to be read by everybody. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have some, especially like during the time that he was writing. Like I think if yeah. he didn't want to reach a, an exclusively black audience, he would have not published in like a mainstream publisher. Yeah, and it kind of just goes like, because his whole every his whole argument is that there has to be a movement on both sides like a togetherness like we're locked in this country together so I think you're yeah you're right like he would see it as not really 
a possibility to speak to either or. Because mm -hmm. I feel like now, like putting that last line that we kind of have like gotten some semblances of understanding now in like that context, it almost feels like a warning to the country of the United States. <laughs> like if y'all don't get your shit together, <laughs> there's gonna be fire. And yeah, I think that, I think it almost, yeah. Cool. Um, well, we are at 12 o'clock exactly. I think this is the first time we finished right on time. Look at that really good at time. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, um, Jamila, for your time and your words and your love. <laughs> and then for me. everybody for tuning in. And we're really excited to launch our next unit um, in August in just two weeks, which is still a secret and a surprise, so stay tuned. And this will be saved here on YouTube so everyone can come back and visit and bask in Jamila's glowing skin <laughs> and words. <laughs> Maybe before I get to my last interview. But yeah, and also if you haven't had a chance to read the book, the free PDF is still on our website. If you haven't had a chance to listen to Jamila's song or watch it, also it's linked in this description as well as hopefully in a post COVID world when she's back on tour, her website is also <laughs> in. Yeah. <the> <laughs> Yeah, it's been not fun to not be able to travel. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that. <laughs> it's like summer in Chicago, which is perfect. But then after that, I have to figure out how to go somewhere. Winter in quarantine is going to be hell. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the problem <laughs> for future us. <laughs> I'm excited to see what next month's books are. So I can be in Likewise. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why it's a surprise. <laughs> It's still in the process. Um, I, we all hope that you find your long lost chicken. Thank Annie. you. We send our condolences in case that she does not turn up. And um, hopefully see you soon with masks on. on yes, yeah, I hope so too. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>